Hello and welcome to Citizens Forum. This is being filmed on Wednesday, April the 16th in Victoria, BC in the Memorial Arena. I'd like to thank our very professional volunteer crew who makes all of this happen and the Shaw staff. Um, the first part of Citizens Forum is always the Walter and Jack show, so I'll start off with um, you know, we've heard a bit about, we've heard a lot really about the ferry cutbacks. I've been, I think that you have to consider, this, and this is what I think, that it's being done to punish the coastal communities because the coastal communities generally oppose uh, pipelines and tankers. And so the corporate community decides that, hey, you know, you want to you wanna play that game, we'll play the game. So they go to uh, Christy Clark in our Liberal government and they say, uh, let's cause a little havoc along the coast. Let's, in order to save $14 million a year, I think that's the number, we'll just, we'll just trash them. Yeah. And we'll pretend it's about $14 million a year. So do I have any evidence or proof of that? Absolutely none. Do I think it's possible? Yeah, I, I think it's, it may be probable. I have no idea. Well, let's try to build up some evidence now that you brought it up. Because um, I've been spending a lot of time looking at the electoral map and who, who voted for whom in the last election. Uh, the coastal communities, uh, Lower Mainland, Vancouver Island, just about exclusively NDP. There's very, you know, just a heavy, heavy support for the NDP. So uh, interior, uh, southern interior and northern interior all the all the constituencies that are dependent upon resource extraction total uh, red on the map so the liberals do have support right through the interior and up north and uh, so I think there's some evidence for you right there that uh, they get their support from the interior and uh, not so much from the from the people uh, of uh, the more urbanized uh, communities, let's say. I think what the people both in the interior and on the coast and throughout the province really want, though, is an economy that allows us to be comfortable and doesn't destroy the planet because that's the problem with the economy we have now. Yeah. I mean, resource extraction, you know, Yes, if we're going to live here, we're using resources, but we can't plunder and loot and pillage and destroy and trash and massacre and totally violate everything, which is like what we do with our, certainly the clear-cut logging of British Columbia. What an environmental disaster. A lot of it done under the right-wing regimes of this province and a lot of it done under the NDP as well. Yeah. It, it doesn't matter who we elect or who we vote for because neither party works for us. I mean, if, if I've got an issue these days, I remember 20 years ago, I'd contact my NDP, M MLA, and, or, you know, I think there's an avenue there. I don't think that anymore. It's, it's none of them care. Well, it, it is learned helplessness. And I believe me, I've, I've talked to MLAs and I'm shocked about just how much they profess they can't do much about anything. It's a, because of the political parties and the, and the party whips say wh what's going to happen. You know, um, I mean, this conversation goes so many different directions, you know, looking at that problem. But getting back to, let's say, this ferry issue uh, that you brought up, and it, it does appear that they're just penny anting people and going to jack up some fares. There's not going to be really much saved. If they took a look at these monsters these ferries that are just huge ships. Ocean liners aren't as big as some of these ships. And they're running half full. Well, why didn't they look at, you know, perhaps going to smaller ships and sailing more often, passenger only sailings, all sorts of options, especially for the big terminals that would save, you know, millions and millions of dollars in fuel. Now they didn't want to look at that because they wanted to build great big ships because there was some empire building going on. So I think there's a, there's a lot of that that happened, really bad, bad decision making. But on the other hand, we have uh, this, this uh, 
you know, this driven, uh, this industry driven economy. And, and, and I think, especially with the folks that live in the interior of BC, like we can set her back on our couches and say, oh, we don't like the Enbridge pipeline and all that and not see any really tangible issues there. Well, these people are trying to put food on their table. All of a sudden, what would be nice kind of gets set aside to actually making the mortgage payment. And they are in that shape in there. And so, you know, that's what's happening is that they're getting the pinch too. They're desperately looking for something to replace the forestry that really isn't there anymore. Well, but it, it's not the Enbridge pipeline because there's no jobs there. What they're talking about is natural gas. That's yeah. the That's the promise that's being made, I guess, to a, but what kind of promise is that? Because you're poisoning your own community. Yeah. You're poisoning your neighborhoods. You're poisoning everything around you. I mean, we know what fracking is and does. So, I mean, what we need are democratic political parties that do what the membership of the parties and the general public wants. Yeah. And we need a media that tells us the truth about what's going on, and then we can start to move forward. It's, it's very late in the game. I mean, we're on the verge of certainly economic and environmental disaster, which leads to social disaster. So something's got to happen soon, and it is going to happen, but, you know, it's a Well, mess. we are, in a, I think, in a, in a crisis night. You know, if you look at, you know, slightly related to this topic is, the, you know, the NDP leadership the non non campaign where John Horgan has now got support of all the caucus and pretty well there's no going to be going to challenge for the leadership. Really strange that that's the case. No new blood, nobody coming forward, no new ideas. No discussion. The no people new. that blew the election and collaborated with the liberals in many cases to lose the election, still there. Uh, now all that is happening and, and you know, and, and, and politics means a lot of corruption anywhere you go. But what's sad here in British Columbia is the the membership of the NDP are so weakened and so anemic, so disillusioned that they 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 allow this to go on. There's no rejuvenation going on in this party. Uh, the NDP are doomed with this crowd. The evidence is pretty overwhelming that you know. They are not the well, people to be in power. The NDP may be doomed with this crowd, but this crowd isn't going to be doomed. They're going to get elected, or they've all got jobs, and they're you know they're they're doing quite well. Yeah. The crowd <laughs> is doing quite well. It's it's the membership and the province that need need political leadership. Yeah, need some hope for something better than and, and that goes for for the people who vote liberal as well. I mean, Well, it makes fools out of us all, including yeah. them. Yeah. And the legislature is a farce right now. It's just uh, a script that's being written by someone else. And uh, you know that, that you have these people in power that really don't offer any new ideas. So, I mean, of course, I'm, I'm really trying to be provocative because I'd really love to see something happen. But there'll never be any change in this province as long, long as they have the prevailing ideology that's there right now. It's just, well, nothing will happen. Yeah. So the question becomes, what can all of us do about this? Um, certainly one thing that we can do is support independent media. Independent media is the only one who is telling this kind of a story. Um, yeah, independent media. Media is not connected yeah. to any funding, and I've been finding that lately. You know, that what look like progressive journals, you know, obviously, you know, are getting funding from different sources that are keeping things from happening. And uh, you have to let the chips fall. You got to search for the truth, and uh, whatever it is, you have to, you know, um, yeah. talk about it. And so, so we need media, and we need more democracy. Which means, which just means, government of the people, by the people, and for the people. Um, right now, I mean, we are 180 degrees, the absolute, complete opposite of democracy. Yeah. At at the city level, we have here in Victoria the Blue Bridge, which was a disgraceful and undemocratic, pathetic, just horrible event, and now sewage treatment, which. 
I mean, in terms of fairness and honesty and openness and democracy, none of those things are there. So that's only in the municipal level. I mean, provincially it's a nightmare and, and federally it's worse. I yeah. mean, there's no democracy. So that's what we have to start to demand. And, you know, really it's our lives at risk now. Well, it's always dark, it's just before dawn, Jack. Maybe, maybe this is as dark as it gets. Uh, I think we have to keep at it, not to give up. And all my good friends and loved ones that are in, in the NDP are, are, who hate me for saying this stuff constantly because they, they think, oh no, we get the only way, we have to defeat the liberals and we've got to kind of not talk about these divisional things within the party. They're so wrongheaded. Because, uh, you know, it's, it's just a political party. It's not a religion. You don't have to belong to it. There's no strict doctrine. Um, and in, if you have a party that's built on lies and half-truths, uh, you're never going to have the foundation that it's going to take to govern. You're never going to have the integrity and the, and the strength to make these tough decisions. And they just simply don't have it. They're going to be this a little appendage hanging off the side of the Liberal Party for a lot of years if they don't, you know, if they don't figure something out. But even if they get elected, in, in terms of the betterment of the province, it, it won't matter because the NDP, I think, and you know, I, I wish I was wrong and maybe I am wrong, but I think from what I can see, the NDP is also completely controlled by the same corporate power structure and, and the same corporate agenda as the liberals take any issue on mm -hmm. on I mean logging uh, you know back when that was the big issue the NDP was terrible in, in my opinion um, now a lot of people don't think that because there was a big media push to pretend that we had the best logging practices in the world nothing had really changed it was just the corporate media and the corporate politicians working together to promote the corporate agenda and you know in terms of to take homelessness today the NDP, I mean, the Liberals have cut taxes, especially to the wealthiest, by about $7 billion a year now. The NDP won't even talk about it. Yeah. You know, we, and, and somehow, it, once it's done, you can never roll it back. Somehow you can never, you know, start taxing again. It just seems like once those tax, you know, taxes are, are not collected, you can't pass any legislation to, to start get, to getting them back. It's, like it's impossible. It's too dangerous to let this small group of people at the top accumulate too much wealth. It's simply too dangerous. So it's got yeah. to be taken from them for their own benefit, as well as the benefit of the rest of us. No, no doubt about it. Your turn. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't. I didn't come with any topics okay. today. Well, um, I'll just uh, repeat what. Oh, okay. Um, well, you know, we could touch on what. Do you have an idea? I'll repeat what I said last week from the uh, United Nations, uh, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which uh, this was a couple of weeks now when they released their report. Mm -hmm. It's as if it never happened in terms of the corporate media. They refused to report it. This is, this is what they said. In a new United Nations report released two weeks ago now or three weeks ago, scientists come to a stark conclusion unless the world changes course immediately and dramatically, the fundamental systems that support human civilization are at risk. And this is not only climate change, we're destroying everything. So in so many different areas, unless the world changes course immediately and dramatically, the fundamental systems that support human civilization are at risk. And yet it's as if they never said it because the media refuses to report it. The politicians will not talk about it, but it's Stanley Cup playoffs time. And you know, the, the country is, you know, and there we go. That's the power the media has Well, how about us. that big threat, the world peace happening in the Ukraine that they were reporting on 24 seven? Whatever happened to that story? Well, it seems to be on the ver. I mean, I know you you, <laughs> you think that's a diversion, but I don't. To me, that's a very real I don't nightmare. I haven't found any evidence that there's anything to be concerned about there. There are some, you know, some regional issues about, you know, uh, what in Ukraine. Uh, but if one side or the other is intent on provoking some real problems, then, I mean, do you really want, 
and that seems to be what they're doing. I don't think they're on opposite sides here. I don't think that Putin and, and, and those people and let's say uh, uh, the leaders of the West and the people in, in charge of the intelligence networks and who are in charge of the standing armies and all that, they don't see it. There's no problem there. They're, okay, there may not happen. be a problem, but the plan still may be to create a war. Yeah, I don't think it's shaping up for that. I, I, I right. don't think it is, Jack. I think it is a huge diversionary story. It might have some merit in what's happened. Of course, the the West was in there and and stirring up things with uh, the Ukrainian nationalists, you know, that are often referred to as neo-Nazis. Um, and there are some things that geopolitical things happening, but it's not the story of this massive Russian army rolling in. Oh no, things. it's not that story. You know. Yeah, the story we're being told in our media about Russia being the bad guy, I don't buy it. I just because I just don't believe the media anymore. I don't believe anything they say. So I, I mean, I've been lied through so many wars yeah. in my lifetime that I don't believe them anymore, and I really recommend that nobody believe them. You just I think if you were going to be cynical that the story they hatched on the Ukraine was simultaneous with this announcement about uh, the crisis of our, our yeah. climate, as well as many other yeah. announcements. Yeah. Well, look at what they did with 9-11. I mean, look, look where that event has taken us, and yet anybody who looks at just the historical facts um, has to think that it's at least 50-50 that elements at the highest level of the U.S. corporate government were involved. You just have to think that. I mean, it's, it's... Yeah, well, you know, if a guy robs a bank and doesn't get caught and they're investigating it later, he's not going to come forward and tell you he did it unless he, you know, th there's no way to force him. And this is what you're happening. I see what's happening. It doesn't matter how much these guys have lied. You know, you're not going to get those words out of their mouths. But if you add the evidence up, you know, yeah, just you, in an objective way, you know, let's face it. They, you know, if you're any kind of an investigator at all, you're going to have to say, gee, you know, the suspect list is, is, uh, is growing from, the, from uh, people involved in Western intelligence and the governments and stuff like that. You just can't deny that. That's just the way the evidence points. And that some of it is a pretty overwhelming. Yeah, so again, how do we move forward? You know, it's, uh, we're in great danger I mean as yeah. we as we move week to week now um, the world's economy is uh, you know I, I don't know I, I mean I think they can destroy it with no our economy reason, whatever Jack, they want. For the, like who owes the money to who yeah. and what's that all about I mean it's such a you know it's just a story that's been made up about how economics work a story made up by the elites to keep everybody else in line but really, you, it, nothing has changed, really. There's, there's abundance in the world. It's just a matter of distributing that abundance you know, in an equitable fashion. No, so you're, you're really, you're absolutely right. I guess what you know, I was saying was they can collapse our economy here in Canada. I mean, they, we're, oh, yeah. but, but the real world economy is that, you know, this is a great and rich country with, with oh, great exactly. people. And all we've got to do is protect it. So, but the problem is that they have the power to kind of overcome all of that and do whatever they want to us and that's what they're doing seemingly but i think everybody has to do their bit and not worry too much about that you know just do the right thing and uh, do your best and maybe something will come out of it eventually you know so what can we do um use less exactly yeah, waste less yeah Consumption's a huge, huge problem, and how we consume products and, you know, the waste stream is huge. Uh, you know, if, if consumers have such power uh, just by choosing products that are safe for the, themselves and the environment, uh, and there's a lot to be said about that and, you know, supporting local growers and local farmers, and there's just a huge amount of good stuff that we can do. Yeah. 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 Yeah, and boy. So, like this shirt, for example, is from Hemp and Company, yeah. which is down on Government Street. Um, it's lasted me very well. Hemp is a, I think, fairly 
green crop, I think. I'm not sure I'm right, but I think it is. Um, it's better than polyester and all that stuff. It's natural fiber. Um, you know, I, I mean, that's a small thing people can do. We can, we can go back to the good cottons that we used to have and forget the pesticide use. Let's, you know, I mean, and, and go back to organic cottons. And yeah, will it cost a bit more? No, no, because we can all be wealthier too at the same time. Well, hemp, you know, as a weed, referred to as a weed, and it grows like a weed. It grows almost anywhere. You don't have to fertilize it, you don't have to water it. It's an incredibly resilient plant. You can make such a range of products. You make automobiles out of hemp. Yeah. So they made it illegal. They made it <laughs> illegal. And that's just the absolute craziness and lunacy of the people running the show. And that's, that's really our biggest problem. The wrong, there's no democracy. The lunatics are running the show. They own the media. They own the politicians. Our governments don't work for us. Well, let's keep working on it. You know, uh, I think uh, there's always a crack in the armor somewhere. You just have to, you know, as Leonard Cohen saying, uh, uh, there's a crack in every, what is the, there's a crack in everything and that's how the light gets in. Okay. You know, you just have to find that little crack and work on it, you know. This is all built on lies and deception and the truth has a certain energy and it's on its own. And you just have to work at telling the truth and. And uh, the other stuff sort of falls away, you know. Walter, thank you very much. Always a pleasure, Jack. And thank you for watching this segment of Citizens Forum. <music> Welcome to segment two of Citizens Forum, being filmed on Wednesday, April the 16th in the Memorial Arena in Victoria. Uh, our guest in this segment is Chris Cook. Chris is the editor of pacificfreepress.com which is a very nice website and has a very good, excellent radio show actually called Guerrilla Radio on CFUV. How can people just go, how do people access CFUV and just find out when the show is on? Well outside of, we, we're over the air FM in Victoria but it's 23 or 2400 watts it's a pretty small signal you know compared to say 50,000 for your average pop station you know but uh, if you're computer capable, cfuv.uvic.ca, and then you can listen to us anywhere, and we, you know, we live stream, and there's archives too. Yeah, and uh, you know, Chris has done some of the best radio, in, in fact, the best radio interview. I think I mentioned that before. The guy from the Hemophiliac Society, if you recall, Mike yeah. McCarty. Yeah, that was a long time ago. That's a pretty old reference there, but <laughs> I've done a lot of really good interviews since. But that was chilling for sure. That was really. That was hor horrifying. So we're going to start talking about um, the Ukraine. Well, yeah, it's on everybody's lips right now I've, in one way or another. Uh, the breaking news, though, today, just before I came over here, uh, are the defections. You know, we saw this in Crimea, too, where a lot of, uh, uh, of the Ukraine military defected to the other side. They didn't want to go and shoot their uh, country people, and especially ones that were from Crimea they went home and when they were asked to do anything they, they took their their tanks and their jeeps and everything with them well there's been another mass defection now the interesting thing is the way it's being reported in our press as uh, uh, maybe uh, uh, Ukrainian military vehicle vehicles being hijacked or being uh, uh, taken over by Russian you know infiltrators or whatever the one thing they're not saying in our press is the is the obvious that the people driving in the military uniforms, driving the military vehicles and changing sides uh, aren't, they're the, the Ukrainian military, you know, yeah, who they're would know? The, they're the children of the people who are living there. Well, they've been asked to open fire on their own people and, and they'll, some of them, well, they won't do it. And that's the end of any, you know, regime is when the, when the military and the police won't crack the whip, when they won't come down, you're finished. And that looks to me to be what's happening right now. They had the Americans sent their CIA chief uh, in secret under a false name of all things uh, to the Ukraine uh, this past week. They denied it and then it was revealed and uh, then they admitted it. And, you know, I mean, it's this, but I haven't heard it anywhere in the, you in didn't the, hear in that? the oh, well, yeah. media. I saw, you know, a couple of emails, but that was it. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, the Americans are desperate to keep this thing going. They started it. I mean, as much as I mean, the, the thing in the English press I read just before coming over here, too, is uh, in the Daily Mail, which is a, a English paper that's you know sort of like a, a Rupert Murdoch Sun, you know, 
kind of equivalent. Uh, now they're painting in broad strokes the, the next new Hitler, and guess who it is? It's, you know, Vladimir Putin oh, is, no. is, is Hitler reincarnated, you know, and uh, uh, the report I saw, I pointed out ironically that uh, Britain's Daily Mail was a great supporter of Hitler before the war. So um, now I guess they've changed sides too. Well, I guess they're just trying to start another war. <laughs> well, you know, it, it's it's funny about that, and the, and Canada's right here. Our prime minister, well, my, your prime minister, uh, he said, and, and forgive me for quoting this here, but when a major power acts in a way that is so clearly aggressive, militaristic, uh, and militaristic, this represents a significant threat to the peace of the world, and it's time we all recognize the depth and the seriousness of that threat. You know, when I was looking at prime minister making those remarks, I couldn't help but think that he was talking about the United States, you know? I mean, who has been more militaristic and aggressive in the world in these last, well, you know, in our lifetimes and more? And we're getting long in the tooth too, Jack. <laughs> but I mean, you know, I mean, this, this is, you, you, you accuse your opponents of doing what you yourself are doing, and then when they throw it back at you, they, they sound ridiculous. And this is a perfect example of our prime minister. Sadly, though, he's ready to commit uh, our blood and treasure, as, as the cliche goes, towards you know, saber rattling and maybe more, you know, all in cahoots with NATO, the, the, now the greatest purveyor of violence on the face of the planet. Is NATO. I would say, yeah. yeah I would agree. Doubt. I would agree. So, I mean, to me, the beginning of this was the destabilization of what was, I think, the democratically elected government yeah. of, of the Ukraine. Now, people, I think there was a broad movement that was very unhappy with the prime minister. Mm -hmm. And those people were in the streets by the many, 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 many thousands. Well, you have to go back to November of last year, really, when, when, when uh, the, the crux of this happened. Yanukovych was elected. He was popularly elected because the previous government was so corrupt, which, you know, the, uh, and some of them, have, uh, Tim, uh, uh, I can't get her name, pardon my French, but Yanukovych was elected anyway. Uh, he wasn't very popular and things were coming down. He agreed, okay, next year I'll have an election, an early election, and if you don't, you know, if things don't get better, you can turf me out. But the real thing that was going on was that there was a pull uh, to get Ukraine's loyalties, and it was between the European Union and Russia. The European Union offered a pretty paltry deal to Ukraine to come closer into their orbit. Uh, and it comprised mostly of these big IMF style loans that would, you know, basically cripple the economy as it did, as it has done Greece and, and other members of the European Union. But they didn't even offer Ukraine entrance into the European Union. So they were getting all the stick with none of the carrot. And they were deeply in debt and still are. The Russians came in and said, okay, we'll give you $15 billion to cover your immediate debt needs and of course uh, uh, Russian gas you know the Ukraine is absolutely dependent on it for their energy needs so they cut them a, a favorable deal said okay we'll give you we'll cut rate on the gas and that's what we offer you and Yanukovych I think sensibly said yeah I think that's the best deal he went back to the people and said well this is the way we're gonna go for now we're not gonna go closer to the EU we're gonna stick with Russia which of course there's their traditional ally I mean the modern Russian state actually was incubated in Ukraine. You know, this is a growth, and they've had you know leaders of the of the former uh, Soviet Union were from Ukraine, which is why Crimea was kind of gifted to them in the first place. But that really, you know, this is where the beginnings of things happened. Now the EU couldn't get their way with the deal, so now they were going to go to the underhanded stuff, and and thus you know the Americans and NATO, and now now we've escalated to this point where. Uh, I heard that uh, people were killed yesterday, uh, so-called militants. Now the CBC and others are calling them armed militants. These are people who are standing in front of tanks a la Tiananmen Square saying, no, we, we're not going to allow you know, transit for the Ukrainian military to go and shoot Ukrainians. Yeah, so, I mean, I certainly don't know. It, it's All I know is I can't believe what the media here is telling me. Mm -hmm. I do believe that this was, that it didn't have to get this bad, but it's more the push from the West 
that is making it bad, the support of, I guess, the United States and NATO, um, who have supposedly put a lot of money into supporting certain people, certain, oh, yeah. I mean, well, the we United here, States they're called neo-Nazis. The, the National Endowment for Democracy is one of the, the uh, weapons that the United States uses. It's, it's so-called soft power. But they admitted to, to spending millions and millions of dollars over the previous five years in Ukraine, developing relationships with opposition circles, training them, you know, teaching them how to you know, make posters, how to do uh, um, uh, social networking campaigns a la the Arab Spring. You know? uh, they spent a ton of money, and a lot of that money is spent for no other reason than to guarantee loyalty of certain thuggish uh, uh, elements within the society and we've seen this with the neo-nazis and that but while we were all watching the neo-nazis and the very colorful display that they were putting on uh, not to mention sniping and killing 20 people which was blamed on yanukovych's people but has been uh, that claim has been dis uh, disproved but in the meantime these so-called new government that was put in without election you know through a coup the one that's recognized by our government and by all the nato members we're signing contracts with Chevron to frack, you know, to, to allow fracking contracts within the Ukraine. So while all of this drama is going on on the one hand, quietly there's corp the Ukraine is being divided up between the corporate West. Oh, whatever they can keep. Well, if this if this stands, I don't, yeah. I can't imagine. So any I, I haven't heard being, this at all. This is the first time I've heard this. Well, that, you know, you got to watch RT, and and you know, yeah, the yeah. CBC. Now, you know, we heard the the CBC cuts were announced last week, uh, and now I'm, I'm not. You don't quote me on the numbers. I think it was 150 or 60 million dollars out of their annual budget, 600 and some odd jobs, or positions. I'm not sure. You know, and, and full disclosure, I worked for the CBC and, and I went through two rounds of layoffs back in the uh, late 80s, early 90s. So close, in fact, that I was laid off and not laid off and laid off again all in one day's time. You know, I was right, you know, balancing on that mark, you know. And when they did their layoffs, they would announce X amount of jobs, but what they meant were positions. So some of those positions weren't necessarily filled. So it wouldn't necessarily mean that many people were going to lose their job, but that many positions would be hived off. And then what happened often, the same people that did lose their jobs circled around and came back and did work for CBC as contractors in, in the film business where I was at the time. You know? But now it seems like um, you know, this is a, another deep one. And uh, I think what isn't being asked about this right now is what do we want the CBC to be? That's, the, that's a very important question, and, and, and what do we want the CBC to be? I know what I want it to be, but I wonder what the people of Canada want it to be. We should know. Well, and what is it? I mean, is it what we want it to be now, and is there a way that we can you know, make it that closer, you know, approximate the wishes? And I don't think that that's been clearly enunciated. It was you know, 75 years ago when the CBC came in, its goals were pretty clear, and the Broadcasting Act was, was strong on it. and, and Nobody questioned uh, the necessity of, of that kind of organization. Today, I don't know that people are so clear on that, and they're, it seems, willing to let this, this whole organization wither away. But as it stands right now, at least in the news division and from what I watch in the news division, I can only say good riddance. I, I, I can barely watch the CBC now and I, uh, on television. I listen to the radio all day you know, in my work as a truck driver, and I listen to the news and it's gotten so bad that they'll lead four or five murder stories. You know, this is, it's like Fox News, but they're not talking about really important issues, especially here in British Columbia. And I, I know you and Walt talked about some of them, but in Victoria, we, this horrendous bridge and the sewage fiasco and uh, uh, the National Energy Board, uh, you know, saying, oh, OK, well, we're, we're not going to include uh, gas plants in environmental assessments. and and other things. I mean, the First Nations are up in arms today, you know, blocking access of government officials uh, into talks because, you know, of these kinds of things. But, you know, are we getting it or are we getting enough of it? I don't know. I, I mean, I know a lot about this this horrible crime in uh, in Calgary, you know, but... And, and I know all about the Vancouver Canucks. Hey, go much, Canucks. much, much more than I want to know. So, well, you won't hear much more about them for no. a little while. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, you will. It never stops. Oh, now, okay. The soap <laughs> opera continues. Uh, and, and I love it. You know, I love it. I've <laughs> followed the Canucks for years. But Sorry, Canucks fans. Yeah. Um, 
the CBC should be controlled by, you know, I think maybe a, a panel of randomly picked or people, people who were interested, you know, thousands could put their names in and we could pick 10 or 15 and they would be a group of people who, who represented maybe the kinds of things that real kids, and they could find out, they just have to ask us what we want to see. I, like, I would just like on radio and on TV, one or two hard hitting, non-corporate, I, I, I mean, mm -hmm. I can't find one show on CBC that I want to listen to either on radio or television. Oh, Maybe I like some of their light news stuff, yeah. you know, and they're, you know, they're, they do what they do very well, you know, but when it comes to the hard news guy, I, I, it really has me, you know, grimacing, I, I tell you. Yeah, it's a disgrace that they don't. They have everything else. They've got everything else. They, got a, they used to have equestrian all day on Saturday afternoons, equestrian. Well, I could do without that. Yeah, but, but you know, can't you do something and put in one or two hard-hitting news shows? Well, you see, and, and the, I think the problem is here, and I really wish they would put out and op open their arms to Canada and, and say, Canadians, what, you know, tell us, you know, I really wish they would do something like that. But a couple of years ago, you remember, Jack, when there was a, a move by the Conservatives uh, to release Peter Mansbridge, uh, the, the anchor of the main news, television news, to release how much money he made? And he, he said, no, I'm not going to tell you what, what I make. And, and the Broadcast Act protects that information, apparently. But they did release that there's 720 some odd people working at CBC, you know, making more than $100,000 a year, which is a good rate. My experience working at the CBC was it was very management heavy. And when the job cuts happened, you know, you saw it starting from the bottom, oh. you know, but, you know, there was a lot of, you know, sort of uh, fat in the middle, you know, but, you know, nobody was making a hundred grand that I was working with, that's for sure. So, I mean, I'd just like to see the CBC be better. Do you want to move on to, uh, you wanted to talk a bit about maybe Venezuela or Ottawa or Well, you know, and this is why we need the CBC, because we need somebody to watch the government. I mean, I think Canadians, we should get a group like uh, Media Watch in Britain to watch the media and report on it, you know, on the job it's doing, especially the media that's supposed to be covering, you know, non-corporate issues. But, you know, our, our government, the, uh, Stephen Harper's new government of Canada, as he likes to call it, uh, they support uh, the, the people that are attempting to overthrow the duly elected government in Venezuela right now with violence, as they did in Ukraine. He supports the Ukraine, another uh, a violent cooster government. He supports Honduras, another government with a, just an atrocious human rights record. I mean, you talk about journalism, those journalists are getting shot down in the streets in great numbers, you know. And no, Mr. Uh, Mr. Harper was the first one in there to sign free trade deals with Honduras. You know, he supports that coup. He support our, our government, uh, Harper and the government before him, the liberals before him, supported the coup government in Haiti. You know, so when we go and stand on the world stage and when he says stuff like this, you know, about clearly aggressive militaristic behavior, you know, Canada is right there, you know, hand in glove with, with the greatest purveyors of violence the world's ever known and yet they're pretending to democracy now what that means is empire always comes home and if we have a government that has no respect for democratic values abroad they can't have respect for democratic values at home and what we see happening in these foreign places we're gonna we'll see increasingly here I mean you saw what happened in Toronto in 2010 where Canada's police force, aided by American police, as it turns out, and they've been trained in the United States, as Rob Wypond of Focus Magazine does an excellent uh, series on this. Well, we saw how they, what they feel about democracy and the rule of law. You know, they were, they were cracking heads in Toronto of, you know, people with one leg and so forth, you know. But, I mean, I guess this is, you know, why we need a media and why we need a real media, not a paper tiger like the CBC has become, at least at the top, in my view. Yeah. We're out of time. Chris Cook, thank you very much. Hey, Jack. And thanks for watching this segment of Citizens Forum. Welcome to segment three of Citizens Forum, being filmed on Wednesday, April the 19th. I'd like to thank again our volunteer crew and the Shaw staff that makes it all happen. Our guest in this segment is Will Smith, and we're going to talk about... Consciousness. Consciousness, okay. So, 
everybody hasn't been privy to our uh, conversations over coffee, but uh, last show I mentioned that I was going to talk about these, what these Russian guys are doing uh, with consciousness. But first, I wanted to talk about the, the uh, altered states of consciousness because we've talked about that before, and you were mentioning today that uh, you'd seen something about how perhaps the Stone Age had a double meaning and it wasn't just people pushing around stones, but also they spent some of their time in altered states. And, uh, and then I, I had seen an article about dolphins, about how uh, dolphins like to have an altered mental state. And I think this is, these are very interesting things because we tend to, in our culture now, in, in our, in our uh, consensus reality, we tend to think of people who uh, engage in exploration of altered states as being somehow lesser or you know, they're, they're druggies or something. But, but it, it's very interesting that we're not the only species that does this. So uh, this uh, BBC documentary, they put a webcam down with the dolphins and they found out that wolf, dolphins like to bat around puffer fishes until they emit this neurotoxin and then they all sort of float up to, the dolphins float up to the surface upside down and look at themselves in the, at the surface so there's a mirror there and they you know who knows what they're doing so what the story is is that the dolphins push around some puffer fish the puffer fish get angry and they emit a kind of neurotox well something something that and they the used to kill fish use that to get high on yeah exactly so so the the question it's comes amazing. to mind is why why are we not why isn't that part of our experience that that part of our, because it is in many cultures. I mean, the, the whole uh, culture in, in the Amazon of the ayahuasca, um, the shamans take ayahuasca to be in a different realm and to bring back answers to help their tribe. And this is something that's been going on for arguably for a long time. So why don't we do that? Yeah, why don't we do that? Why is it kind of. Why is there a taboo? Upon? Yeah, why is it a tab? Why why is marijuana illegal? So do you think maybe Fracking it's because it might be because people would have a different point of view? I mean, if you if you remember what we were talking about on the other show, the the plants have intelligence that can be accessed when people take these these other these these chemicals, these uh, ayahuasca. So well, not only that, but I remember many like decades ago there was that book we talked about it once before the. I can't remember. The Secret Life of Plants. The Secret right. Life yeah. of Plants. And basically yeah. they, they, they could measure, you know, e electronically or electrically that if somebody did something bad to a plant, then the neighboring plants would react to that. And when that person came back, they would react to him. I right. mean, the Secret Life of Plants. And I mean, that was a big thing a long time ago. But that's been pushed completely aside. And, and we're constantly told that nature has... You know, nature is just there for us to destroy. Well, yeah, let's, let's, so let's go. I, I bought this uh, book called Formula of the Universe, and it's um, by Arkady Petrov, a Russian academic. And it, the subtitle is Bioinformation Technologies for the 21st Century, Cosmopsychobiology. So this, this book is, a, is more on, it's from another point of view of the, of the uh, what's going on with the looking at the shamanistic uh, view of the universe, they're accessing altered states just natively by. Uh, they don't even have to do anything, but they can get into an altered state where more than one person is in a vision space, and they can diagnose people who have diseases and cure them. So they're what they the way they're trying to create a model for how this works, and so they call um, this other space the information domain. And the way I like to think about that is that, you know, if we have something, we can represent it as the thing itself, but we can also have information about it. So if we look at language, we can say, there's a dog, okay, so there's a dog sitting there. That's the material object. We can represent the dog. We can say D-O-G in English, and that means dog. Or we can have a Chinese character, which is also a representation of the dog. Now, those are just tokens that represent the dog, but conceivably we could have more information about dogness wrapped up in that, in that picture. So Sanskrit, for example, is a language that 
is an object-oriented language that starts at a very top level defining all things that exist in the universe in both in any realm, in the material realm or the spiritual realm, and then it goes down from there. And, they, and what they say about Sanskrit, the people who teach it, is that it's actually a creative language so that the vibrations of speaking Sanskrit um, activate, somehow activate matter and can create things. So that's the idea. Whether or not that's true or not doesn't matter for this discussion. It's just saying that there's there's the possibility that 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 could happen. That we that the universe that we live in is created real time around us by consciousness and vibration. So the, an analogy of that is that uh, how is a rainbow made? Well, all these raindrops are falling down, and energy shines through them, and this rainbow is created by just the fact that all these, uh, all these uh, raindrops are falling down to the earth. So are the raindrops conscious of creating the rainbow? Probably, well, we, don't, we can't really answer that question, but presumably, for our, again, for our picture, they're not. They're just doing it. So that's kind of the picture that the Russians, these guys have of how we operate in our space, is that the universe is being created dynamically by us, by every sentient being in the universe, real time, and that we have this ultimate power to be able to control that, but we just don't know how to do it because we're not conscious of those abilities. So they're, they're trying to uh, teach people how to access those abilities, and they're fairly successful at it. So that's, that's a wow. really, really interesting thing that's going on over there. And one of the things, it doesn't say it in this book, but in, uh, in one of the books that Arkady Petrov has written, he started a, he and another fellow named Igor Arepiev, uh, started an institute to teach people controlled clairvoyance and when they first started they had to vet each person very carefully because some some people wouldn't be able to do it they would know by their their basic structure belief system that they wouldn't be able to do it but now evidently they can teach anybody to do these things what is clairvoyance clairvoyance is the ability to uh, see from from an inner well there's a there's a the way I, the model I use to explain it, because this is, you know, we're out in woo-woo space here, and, and so the, the model that I use is that the pineal gland, which looks like an eye structurally, but it's embedded on the inside of our head, somehow gets activated and responds to wavelengths that we are not, that we can't measure or that we're not aware of. I mean, this is, this is old stuff. It's been around for thousands of years. You can, you can read about it in, in Greek, uh, some but what does clairvoyance mean? It just means that you're able to see on a different level. You're, you're able to see reality from a different point of view. And, and what, the way they describe it is you're seeing things from the, in the information domain. So you're actually seeing the structure behind our physical universe. So you're, when, you, when you change something, like when they're healing a disease, they're not really pushing around atoms anymore. They're, they're restructuring the, the way that the... the the person comes into being real time. So, so in other words, you have to accept this model says that the only thing that exists is now. There's nothing else. The future, the past is, is uh, just, it, it's, it's something that was but is no longer, and the future has to be created. <coughs> so this table and these cups and, and the paper that's on it. Mm -hmm. There's information and energy that's constantly being that, that's constantly available and they so the, somehow the energy coalesces to form a table made by matter and so what I'm saying is it we can't see we can't with our neocortex we're not we just can't get around that we, we can't see how that works but we can make pictures to, to explain how it works and our right brain can understand it a little bit better if we use a picture so when I say the raindrops are falling down the light shines through them and there's a rainbow Okay, so, so something like that similar is happening. There's energy present in our universe, and you and I agree that that table is there, and everybody else in here agrees that that table is there, and there are a lot of sentient other, other uh, beings or creatures in here that create that table. But it's all, it's all like we're singing a song together, and it's in harmony, and, it's, and it creates the table. Okay. Does that... See, the, we're getting in the problem, and... and uh, Petrov identifies this very clearly, is that we're trying to analyze things with our neocortex that are outside of its ability to understand. Okay, and but, but earlier we were talking about some kind of more sp like specific happening today issues, I think. Yeah. This is before we got here. So can you take these ideas and put them into one of those things? <clears throat> 
it's going to be pretty hard for me to do that point blank on the spot here because I didn't think about that. Okay. I mean, I spend a lot of time thinking about analogies, and I, I would like to do that. Maybe we could do that on the next time I come okay. on the show because it, it's very difficult stuff to think about. And, and, the, and the thing is, is that it's outside of the time-space reality that we have. And so I, I confess that I, it's hard for me to access this stuff. And I read about it and I think, well, here's an example. Okay, so the shamans, when you take this, uh, when you take this uh, ayahuasca or DMT, typically people meet a snake and the snake talks to them and tells them stuff. So you mean people take ayahuasca, which is a, a drug, yeah. and every, lots of people have exactly the same Yes. Oh, that's interesting. Well, the same, the same, they access something that's similar. I mean, each yeah. person will access something different depending on their makeup. But typically, there's a snake. Interesting. So interesting. the snake, you know, can oh, be an snake. image, it can be the, the uh, symbol for knowledge or whatever. But the, but the whole thing is, is that this comes through in a symbolic language. And, and so uh, that's the same thing with this. It's, they're saying that what happens is, you eventually learn when you become able to handle that. I mean, it's a big deal when you, if, from what I've read, I haven't done this stuff, but, but I've accessed this space from meditating and from doing a flotation tank. It's very similar. I mean, I get the same things. The same things happen to you. So anyway, there's this, when you first access this space, it's scary. I mean, a snake comes up to you and stands in your face, you're, you're going to be scared, right? So you have to get over that. But we're kind of programmed to worry, to just not worry about those visions that we're capable of receiving through this half of our brain. We're told, let's work on this half of our brain, and anything that shows up there, ah, it's for artists, musicians, that kind of people, but they can't make any money. Well, what just, is this half of our brain? Well, it's the, the, one, it's the artistic the one we're side. Always, so the one we're always told to focus on is the... Is the, the left, it's the cognitive side that, that's locked in time, that lets us do mathematics, that, you know, that lets us do all these cognitive skills and functions. And these guys are going more into to the vision side where you, everything is symbols, everything is pictures. It's not, and it's not linear. You see a picture and it doesn't, it's, it, the sequence isn't important. In our school system, which side of our brain are we taught to use? Only. This? Only. Yeah. That doesn't sound good. Well, no, I mean, and so that's why this, is, this whole thing is so fascinating is because the people, the, the few people from our culture who do show up and, and figure this stuff out are, are, you know, they're pretty quickly disenfranchised from the mainstream because they're, now, they're, now they've taken drugs, so, you know, there's something wrong with them. I mean, and somebody who's gone, a scientist who's gone down to the Amazon and taken ayahuasca and who comes back and says, you know, reality really isn't the way we think it is. And, I mean, there's uh, Dennis, uh, Dennis McKenna, Terrence McKenna's brother, who's a, he's an academic. You know, he's, he came back and I think he said that uh, his, the message to him was, you monkeys just think you're in charge. So, you know, when you start getting stuff like that and you, you, these intelligent people who are in our system and who are our leaders and they say, time out, we got to change our models, I pay attention to that. And John Perkins, for example, who used to work for, I think, for the CIA, his whole thing is we have to create, we have to envision our new world, the world that we want to live in. Well, that doesn't sound very practical to a guy like me. I mean, that, doesn't, that just sounds like he's taken too much ayahuasca. But maybe it'll work. But, but now I read these guys, and they're saying the same thing in a different way. They're not taking ayahuasca, but, but ayahuasca is DMT, and DMT is generated by the pineal in the absence of light. You can, get, you can go on this ayahuasca trip without taking anything. In Thailand, there's a, a center, a meditation center, and you can go in there and spend three days in the dark. And you're, at that point, after you've been in, the, in utter darkness for three days, your pineal starts emitting DMT, and you're on a trip. <laughs> and you visit, you, Turn off the lights. Yeah, so I mean, this, this is what's happening. I, I think that this is the most, probably the most important thing uh, that's, that we have to look at because the, pro the problems that we're facing are frankly impossible. They are impossible according to our science. Uh, you know, I mean, we could argue about it. You could get some PhDs in here and they'd tell me, they'd, you know, slaughter me and I'd be... <laughs> <laughs> just push you out the door. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, I can't, I'm not gonna... But, but I would agree but, with you. The but I'm just saying, are, you know, are. it's really, it's really interesting, this stuff. For some reason, I read a book like this which is very difficult for me to read because the translation is so poor, but then I can see things from a different point of view. And I think that's what each of us needs to do is just kind of 
get to where we see things from a different point of view and we don't say, well, bumblebees can't fly because science has proven that they can't fly so they must not be able to fly. I mean, he gives an example in here of how science, how science is kind of like the church in, in some ways. And in the, I think it was in the 18th century in France, the Academy of Science in France declared that rocks could not fall from the sky. And so when a, if somebody said, well, I, a rock came through the ceiling, you know, a meteorite came through and, and hit my dog and killed him, they'd send a team of scientists out there and, tell, and educate them, rocks can't fall from the sky. So instead of looking at the phenomenon and trying to analyze it and figure it out, they just ignore it, which is essentially what we do. And our science now is focused on monetary gain. There is no pure research anymore. You can't get a, you can't get a no strings attached grant to study something. It's, it's from a company that wants to pay for it and you better come up with something so they can sell something. So, I mean, the, the pure research has kind of gone by the wayside. Anyway, that's kind of a scattered uh, explanation. I know we've only got two minutes left, but uh, <laughs> What do you, is, how does that sit with you? What do you think about all this stuff? You know, anything jumping out? Well, I mean, this is, this, these are things I, I never talk or think in these terms, but when you say it, I like it. You know, I, I, I kind of like the ideas it, it puts out there, which are ideas I never have. <clears throat> yeah, me too. I, I mean, I, I don't like to think that, we're, that our situation is hopeless or that, you know, that the, the bad guys can do whatever they want. And I think this is what's happening is that, I, mean, I just sent you an article about how Mark Twain had an experience 150 years ago where he saw his brother in a vision. He saw his brother die. And even after it happened exactly the way he saw it in a vision, he didn't want to write anything. He didn't want to release anything about it until after his death, even though he found it fascinating, just because he didn't want the, the grief from the press, right? I mean, he yeah. was a, now I find that interesting that even 150 years ago, it was like that. I mean, it shows you where we are, really. If you have anything that's unorthodox, you're going to get slammed. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, that's true. But right now, we need the unorthodox. We need it. We yeah. need some people who are willing to go see if you do fall off the edge when you sail. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because we, we are going through a model, a change of model that's like that. You know, it's that revolutionary. Yeah, like, hold on. <laughs> Will Smith, thank you very much. Thank you. And thanks for watching this week's Citizens Forum.